we'd like to find out what, if you have a question that drove you here, because we've got a lot of stuff that, that we can talk about. We want to make sure that if you do have something top of mind, burning question, I really want to know I had this horrible experience, and that, that, that we can find out about that before we start. Yes? Well, I'm a total newbie. I haven't taught an online class before, but it's just around the corner. So it would be helpful for me, and maybe you'll do this anyway, <coughs> to hear about that learning curve, because I'm assuming that you've also taught an online course, so, or, or have not mm -hmm. But what was that like? No, I'm, I'm a newbie. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good yeah, one. They'll, they'll definitely be speaking to us. Great. Okay, and anybody else have a, yeah? So I, I also, I don't teach online, but I'm really interested in sort of how to supplement traditional classroom stuff with all the online resources that mm -hmm. completely confound me. And mm -hmm. I assume we'll always break every single time I try to use one. So. I recently had a fabulous experience where no, nothing broke. Okay. Um, one more. Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. I'm a complete technophobe. And yet, at the same time, I am interested in this idea of flipping the classroom, where if I do the lectures, then we can spend class time on something more productive. Yeah. Great. OK, so how about we flip the classroom? Okay, anything else? OK, don't want to crimp your style, but we do got to move on. Yes, you had your mouth open. I saw you. Just breathing deep. Just breathe. OK. Yeah. No, okay. I, yeah. No, I watched only Thank You, Dad, and um, Richard Pryor. Okay, I'm turning this over to people who actually know something. Okay, thank you, Pat. And we're going to answer your questions. And um, we, we had a lot of people who signed up, but it's 4 o'clock, and they realize they're tired and they want to go home. And we're just happy that you came. Um, I'd like to introduce myself and the panelists. I'm going to start with Pat Ofterheide, who just introduced um, the question taking. And Pat is a university professor and teaches primarily in SOC. I, uh, to my far right is Stephanie Brooks-Steen. She's the Assistant Dean of Online Learning in SPECS and SOC. To my left, I have Bobby Baggio, who's the Associate Dean of Graduate and Online Learning in SPECS. I'm Iris Krasno. Um, I teach uh, in SPECS and SOC. Do you SOC. think everybody knows what SPECS is? No. The School of Professional and Extended Study. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, the name. Uh, it sounds like sex, but it's not. It's specs. Um, and uh, we like the name a lot, although a lot of people don't know what it is. Um, I also am the director of the LEAP program, Lifelong Empowerment and Professional Development. I'm also on the AU Healthy Wellness Council. And I wear a frog pin to remind myself that every day we should take a leap into a new area, a new uh, a mode of learning a new life and so I hope that all of you leave today um, willing to at least think about uh, taking a leap uh, into a new teaching mode um, and we're each going to speak for about five minutes and then we're going to take questions and then we'll speak some more um, I'm <coughs> the newbie that launched her first course ever uh, on in, in online learning and Stephanie Brookstein who goes next um, will describe how she made this happen. I am a journalist. I'm theatrical. I love one-on-ones. I couldn't believe that I would ever, 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 ever do this in my whole life. I've been at American University for about 25 years. Uh, I started when I was 10. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it, it, the whole idea of it was, it wasn't even, uh, uh, it, it just seemed absurd that we would actually, and I teach writing and, you know, journalism, and I, and I love the one-on-one. -on -one. I love looking at your faces right now and just connecting in a classroom. Uh, and, and the power uh, and the relationships and the intimacy uh, that comes out of um, online learning, uh, that comes out of in-person learning. And I'll just, so Stephanie and I worked together. I took the plunge into online learning. Um, Bobby is our Associate Dean of um, Online Learning and 
at SPECS, uh, and Stephanie is working with SOC and SPECS on on learning and online learning. And we decide, I live in Annapolis, Maryland, and so it's, it's a pain, you know, to drive in all the time. And so I was open to this because I taught a course called Write Well and Get Published for um, a, a adult women audience, adult audience, and it, it worked really well. And, and we thought that we could just put this into an online format where the students could, I mean, because writing you do in solitude. It's not like you write in, um, in class. Um, and the tools that I could give them in a lecture, we could easily videotape. We're not going to navigate the site for you. But for those of you who've never taught online, this is what a home page looks like. And I didn't know anything. In fact, I just went on Facebook like three months ago. I just learned Twitter. I was the last to go on online. I know how to navigate every single button on the left there now. Stephanie worked with me once a week for one hour for six months. And Joy Adams over there too, where we created, uh, we, we did videos together. Every week we met on the phone or Skype and she just walked me through it. And, and what, what, what became, it became so much fun to be a grown-up, I'm 61, and learn new things. You know, to be an adult who learns new things is really the key to us staying invigorated and useful and alive. If you don't keep growing um, every step of the way, it, um, to me, it was very exciting. It, it, it was almost like I teach a lot of adults, um, you know, like some of my 70-year-old students, go start taking salsa dancing and they get really excited because they have never salsa danced. So this was something I'd never done. I also just want to share that as a writer and an author and a journalist, <coughs> I'm really picky about how people write. I got some of the most powerful, intimate, descriptive writing out of these students. I had 17 students. Uh, than I've ever had in any of my classes. In fact, I had a, a young woman uh, who's from Monticello, Georgia, very shy, never taken a writing class in her life, uh, took my class online, and she, she, she said, you know, Professor Kresner, I don't know what I'm going to write about. And I said, well, what's stuck? You know, I, I, one of my assignments was write about your, your biggest challenge, your biggest loss, your toughest moment. So people really had to dig within uh, to... Uh, to evoke descriptive uh, language. But she said, you know, I went to a high school that was very racially mixed and there was a lot of prejudice and nobody talked about it. And I'm just going to read you like one paragraph. She said that uh, when Barack Obama won the first presidential election, there was almost a riot in her school. And this is from a student that had never written any journalism before in her life and just kept coming into the classroom. And Stephanie, you'll describe how how we worked. You know, I did a, a, a synchronous session and I, I, I met the students once a month in person. But this is a student who's an, an econ major who came to our and took my class and she talked. Barack Obama won his first presidential election on November 4th, 2008. On November, on November 5th, there was chaos in Jasper County Middle School. Wooden bleachers throbbed with the energy potential of a riot. They were the same bleachers my dad had posed on for his senior yearbook picture in 1978. Now the building housed the middle school, and the black kids and white kids had arranged themselves on two different sets of bleachers. The desperate scent of Axe body fray failing to cover preteen must was muted under the frightening organizational powers of a middle school mob. Tribally, tribally postured against each other, they chanted, no bomber keep the change, and the other side, yes, we can. I sat with my friends off to the side in a neutral zone with others who were too preoccupied for politics, and I remember huddling against my backpack and waiting for the tide to pass, praying it would pass, wishing I wasn't just as white as the swelling group nearby. Now, this student hadn't written, I laid eyes on her four times in 13 weeks, and this happened, and I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie in one minute. I write books, and, and I do it in solitude, and I do it on my own pace, in my own place. <coughs> and what this did is released students to be free and, not to, and, and to feel the anonymity. Thank you, Bobby. 
of being unleashed and not being looked upon and to really be free to write when they want. So 3 a.m. is my big time. I know I go to bed at 9. I write really well from 3 to 7 a.m. And also, so, it, so this was free to write when you want and to have deadlines. They knew their deadlines, but they could write when they want. And for me, and I'll be really frank, when you teach online and you're, you're in a video chat or whatever you call it, you get to wear your pajamas from waist down. I mean, you, they had no idea of where, what, you know, those uh, flannels. And from waist up, you got to look pretty good, a little lipstick and wherever <laughs> you are. But you are so in control. And so as a teacher, as a professor, it really released me to be my most free um, as well. So. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Bergstein. I'm the Assistant Dean for Online Learning. And as Iris mentioned, I work in two schools right now. I work in SOC and Specs. I was hired in the fall of 2013 here, primarily in SOC and um, as a director. They were launching one of their first online programs. And I've been working um, with various institutions for the last 10 years doing this. Um, and I've worked with faculty in all different content areas. Um, and at AU, when I came here, um, I remember going to my first online staff meeting. And I was really excited, the previous institution I had had dabbled in online and, and had been doing it for a number of years, so we had quite a few people involved. I went to my first meeting here and there were three people um, in the fall of 2013, which is not that long ago. Uh, we actually, <coughs> AU very quickly jumped into online programs. They've been doing online courses for a number of years, but online, fully online programs with full support really just started that year. And um, over the last two years, we've gone from one fully online graduate program to I think we have a total of 16 right now in two years. Um, we actually had to stop our meetings because last summer they got to a point where we couldn't get all of the people who work here now that are involved in one room. So AU has recognized that it takes a lot more than just saying, hey faculty, you want to put a course online? We have about two people in one department who can help you. Um, now we have a lot more. So. So it's been a really interesting place to be and really exciting to be a part of it. Um, I, I will tell you, just to address some of the things that you guys mentioned, uh, online development and developing courses online <coughs> is what I like to think of as a science. Um, just like you and, and Iris, you're very passionate about what you studied and, and what you research and what you do. Um, I went to school and I got my master's degree in instructional technology. My entire focus and everything I love about what I do is instructional design and what that is is really working with faculty in any area I really say anywhere from basket leading to neuroscience I could sit down with you and help you create a course um, that's what we do as instructional designers that's what we want to do we're not looking to um, in, intrude on your territory at all and I think a lot of times that's almost kind of the first thing that stops faculty when I've worked with them is I don't want anybody helping me to teach my course I've done this for 15 years I know what I'm doing um, you know back off and for us, that's kind of the first challenge is saying, hey, look, we get it. That's why we're here. We want to look at your course, see what you've done. And <coughs> just like you study what you do, we study what's going on in the online world. And we look at the latest technologies and what's happening, different methods, different pedagogical approaches um, that work well. And we have a, a, a structured approach to how we design courses. And the first is analyzing learners. Um, and analyzing your audience. Who are these students going to be? Are they going to be undergraduates? Are they going to be graduate students? How many years of experience? Do they have a course they have to take before this? What skills are they coming into this course with? Um, when I worked with Iris in her course, so this is, this is a course that is done kind of in isolation. It's not part of a program, um, which is what um, the majority of courses up until two years ago were here at AU. Um, she owns all the intellectual property behind this. That's one of the questions that I get. That's the second question after they're like, okay, I guess I'll talk to you. Um, <laughs> now, who, you're not going to steal all this, right? This is still mine. Um, and, and the answer is yes, um, but there, there are different situations going on at AU, and I do want to mention those briefly because I'm sure you've heard of them. So we at it as a university have partnered with a couple of different outside organizations to help provide that instructional design support. So if you're working as part of a program, um, you might be working with an, uh, an organization called To You. Um, they are well established and have a great team. Um, I don't work with them here, but I have had colleagues, who, I do have colleagues who do, um, and I've heard really great things. But they have their own instructional design team that they bring in as part of our relationship to support faculty in developing courses for those programs. The organization I primarily work with is Wiley, um, formerly Dell Tech. 
Um, the same concept, they're the same type of organization, just have a little bit of a different business strategy. And they come in with their instructional design support. Then we have the AU courses. So the, the programs <coughs> that are fully online have a lot of strategy and administration involved before we even start to identify faculty to teach. Um, we have to think about how we're going to do that. Are we going to develop a course once and offer it over and over again, which is a really good strategy and what most of our programs do here. In those cases, the intellectual property um, is done through a contract and um, it is, you do sign over a certain level of rights to AU. Um, nothing ever goes outside of AU. It doesn't, these or organizations have nothing to do as far as that's concerned. Um, but that is a different type of contract. And, in, and the reason for that is because we are gonna have other people teach what you develop. I mean, we really are looking to expand what you've done and share that with other faculty and for them to use that as a platform. AU courses, the intellectual property falls under the same intellectual property agreement and that we have at AU for all faculty. There's no separate agreement for this. So um, I did just wanna touch on that because usually that comes up pretty fast in these discussions. With IRS, when we started working on this, um, we did the, that first thing, we analyzed the learner audience. Um, is this, and that will help determine whether or not it's gonna be fully online. This was developed for an <coughs> undergraduate population. Um, we weren't um, sure that at an undergraduate level, one thing that we're hesitant with is whether or not they're gonna be able to do this fully online in isolation without any student support. Um, in our programs, we have students go through an orientation and they have a student support coordinator that they work with throughout the duration of their program. With these one-off courses, we don't have that. So we really wanna take a look at what's gonna be right for them. For these undergraduate learners and because of Iris's teaching style, we really thought that having some type of synchronous component and face-to-face -face component would benefit not only her as an instructor getting more comfortable with online, but also the learner. So we developed this as what we call a hybrid because there was a face-to-face -face component. Every week, Iris held um, a virtual classroom. So you can kind of see these online class meetings. And we use the tool Collaborate, and I think there's a session at this very moment <coughs> going on about that. Um, so uh, if, if you're interested in learning more about that tool, definitely reach out to eLearning. Um, they're more than happy to set up a training. Um, but it's, it's you know, it's if you've done any type of virtual meeting or webinar, it's the same type of tool. It's, there's just a lot of people who make them. Um, it's really easy to use once you learn how to use it. Um, we definitely had a couple of hiccups. Um, somebody said, I'm afraid, I'm afraid things are gonna break. And you know what? Sometimes they do. Um, it happens and uh, Iris had me speak at the first class that she held in person to just kind of introduce everybody to the online space and navigate. And that was one of the first things I said. And when I teach, it's one of the first things I say is, you know what, I'm not perfect. I don't expect any of you to be and I know the system's not. So, yes. Can yeah. I just be really clear because I really am at a one-on-one -on -one level and I'm not brave enough to admit this. Can I, do, you, do you think we could save questions before, oh, you, sure. you know what I want to do is I, I know that Stephanie's going to have a lot of questions. I'd like each of our panelists to present their, you know, and then okay. can you come back and ask it's Stephanie? It's a basic terminology question. Oh, okay. Yeah, if it's a clarification question. Yeah. yeah. Synchronous versus asynchronous. Sure. Oh, good. So okay. um, synchronous is when you are requiring students to do anything at a specific time. So in this case, our synchronous component was every Thursday at 6 p.m., you must log into the class because I'm going to have a live session with you. But it was recommended, not required. Okay. And I would require it next time, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, asynchronous, which is especially at a graduate level when we're developing the graduate programs, those learners, um, and again, this goes to that first step in our instructional design process, really mm -hmm. analyzing the type of people that are gonna be taking the course. Our learners have professional and personal lives. They're not able to come to campus. That's usually why they're taking it online. Um, as a strategy, a lot of fully online programs don't have a synchronous component. Um, they might have a couple, but it's usually not as regular as this was. Um, and what we'll do in that case is, um, is asynchronous then. They're asynchronous courses where we're not, there's no specific time. So you don't have to come on every Tuesday night, um, but there are deadlines in place. So. Asynchronous sometimes, because it's a relatively new term, um, students think, great, I got eight weeks to do this whole class, I'll just do it when I want, that's fantastic, that's awesome. Not the case at all. Um, asynchronous courses are, all online courses are very structured and you'll see that and that's the design, yeah. the kind of science, scientific approach to it. Um, but 
we do have strict deadlines in place. So yeah, you can do whatever you want as long as you have this done by Wednesday, this done by Friday, and this done by Sunday. And you grade each. I, I want you to hold that thought because I know there's going to be a lot of questions for Stephanie who really designs a class, and I want to move it over now to Bobby to give um, so an overview of really what's going on in online learning at AU right now. <clears throat> and then lots of questions. So I've been hope. here since uh, August. <laughs> I've been in online learning for 20 years. Um, my PhD is in ID, and um, I love what I do. I do you know what ID is? That's instructional design. Okay. We have our own <laughs> set of um, acronyms, like, just yeah. like the government or, or any yeah. good discipline. We have our own set of acronyms that, that you'll, you'll get used to if you hang around us long enough. Um, I, I think um, we have some challenges here. I think um, we have some opportunities. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is I saw around 2011 higher ed shifted. There was a big change in the acceptance of online learning from 2000 and two to 2010, but then around 2011, when we went 4G, <laughs> and video became very uh, commonplace, uh, synchronous, which means everybody's here together, asynchronous is anytime, anywhere, think of Facebook, um, became commonplace, higher ed's attitude towards this as something that was a passing fad and something that was going to kind of come and go and wasn't going to be a disruptive technology changed. Mm -hmm. And the big schools, Yale put their medical school online. We came up with MOOCs. Harvard put their executive MBA online. I could go on and on. Um, so the mindset shifted and it became accepted. A lot of schools, big schools, University of Central Florida, 60,000 uh, students, made a definite move that all of their classes, not some of their classes, all of their classes will be blended. Mm -hmm. There was a tremendous shift in terms of you may take two classes while you're an undergraduate online to you must take one, one at least one online class a semester. And I think the reason behind that is we've been at this now for 20 years. And we have a lot of data that shows when this is done well, how effective it can be. And I'd really like to address uh, your um, situation. And one of the first things that, that people who are new to this have to realize is online is based on constructivism. It's based on learner-centered pedagogy, not instructor-centered pedagogy learner-centered pedagogy, which for most people and for most learners who have been through traditional education their whole lives is 180 degrees from what they've been exposed to. So it's all new. It's all new. And what you think would work online is not necessarily what works online. So there's a science behind what we do and why we do it. Uh, nothing happens um, kind of haphazardly in, in ID. We have a plan with everything we do. Now, it, it might not always work exactly the way we planned it, but we have an intention with the instruction. There's a design behind it. So I think, you know, when you're new to this, kind of listen, ask a lot of questions, experiment, um, and then ask more questions. Um, and, and just remember that the emphasis is on five interactions. Learner to learner is the most powerful interaction online. Learner to the content is second. Learner to the instructor is third. Learner to the interface is fourth. That's the interface with the technologies. And that should really be transparent. So they should be so familiar with that that they don't have to think about it. What's the second one? Learner to the content, whatever you're teaching. <clears throat> and the last one is vicarious interaction. 
that's people's ability to kind of snoop and stalk and kind of observe what other people are doing. That takes place online. So if you think of everything in terms of interaction, uh, it makes this whole thing a whole lot easier. And what, uh, and it's Pat's coming up, but uh, one of the most fun things for me, and fun is, you know, not the right word, interesting, uh, was when our students talked to each other. You know, they had, as part of their grade, they had to comment on, on each other's. And, you know, I made it very clear they couldn't just say, oh, it was very good, I really enjoyed it. They had to really dissect and critique each other's writings. And it was very raw and real and probably, as Bobby mentioned, much more helpful than anything, you know, I hope I helped them too. But just really like, oh my gosh, you overuse cliches, you know, some of the students said. So Pat has not taught online before, is that correct? No, I have very blended classes. Okay. Um, and um, I have always taught uh, flipped classrooms. So, or whatever what that term is now. <laughs> I mean, whatever it is, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Um, and it has been fabulous to have access to the virtual environment to be able to park so much stuff and to be able to continue conversations. Hmm. Um, so, so for me, uh, so many of the Blackboard features are important. Collaborate has been very important. And believe it or not, <coughs> it's working fine. I just, had, I just had two Collaborate experiences that were glitch-free. When, when you're um, on Collaborate, are you talking to your students? Do you yes. go, oh, okay. Yeah. Talking with PowerPoints and vid okay. video, um, so so um, which has allowed me to travel for research as well as to, as to teach. So uh, I am I am very interested in, in what what Iris's experience has been because it's very it's very um, reassuring to me as, as we're moving into this environment. Um, and I was able to see how how close. If you are working in a, an extensively blended environment, how close you, you are already to working online. And I think most of us, in fact, are, are working in a pretty blended environment. Um, and I don't tape lectures, I, uh, although you could. But I'm, I'm, I'm convinced people don't watch anything longer than seven minutes. So I, do, I, don't, I don't think that that's, that's a very good use of the, 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 the site. But the, the reason why I think I have any reason to be here is, 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 uh, is more because I've done a lot of work on how to use copyright in the digital <coughs> environment. And one of the things that happens when you teach um, digitally, whether you're, whether you're teaching in, in a regular classroom environment with Blackboard as your uh, electronic space or you're doing fully online, is you do have these questions about what is going to be okay for me to put up there of other people's stuff uh, that's not already licensed by my university. Uh, and fortunately, I have had the privilege of working with uh, a, a, the major legal scholar on this issue worldwide who happens to be over at Washington College of Law, a guy named Peter Yassi, for the last decade, clarifying for different communities of practice what is appropriate uh, use of other people's copyrighted material that would be encouraged by the law, that would not be infringing legally, and that would also be ethical. Um, I'm not going to tell you about what those are because we've been able to develop a very, very extensive website. Do you, do you mind just going to cmsi.org? Um, oh, sorry, so cmsimpact.org slash fair. Oh, good. Okay. So if you go to um, our site, oops, not available. Yes, it is. MS or SN? CMS. CMS. Oh, CMS Impact. But what I also did was to um, just bring some materials so that rather than listening to me blather on about how you can apply fair use, you can actually just read about it. And then once you've read about it and you have some questions about your own <coughs> use, I really welcome your questions. But uh, the short course is that there's, there's a lot more that you can do fairly without hurting the people who uh, have made that material and who have genuine rights to it than you might think. And that's it. So Take it away. when I decided to, to, to go online, or I had not decided, Pat was the first person um, I called, and we had a lengthy phone conversation. and, and this was so important as a journalist that you're sharing other people's work, but also I knew that I was doing 
that I was sharing my intellectual property. You know, it, it's taken me 25 years to develop a lecture called The Art of the Interview. And I'm sharing that in one of my videotapes, um, which we're not going to see. And, and I just felt like anybody, and anybody could just take that. And, you know, if it, if it lives forever on the internet. And it, I was reassured when um, Stephanie uh, said that, that you own that. And I also thought if I leave, um, if I leave, can anybody just teach my Right Well course and use my videos and, 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 and intellectual property? And in this case, right now, they cannot. I mean, this is my course. And there's other schools that are actually interested in. And Bobby is, um, you know, developing, I hope, um, you know, writing master's online degrees that might integrate this course. So anyway, you've heard a lot from us about what we do and we do different things and don't do different things. So is there any more questions? I mean, the, what I said in the beginning about my frog pin and taking um, a leap into new frontiers, um, rather than be scary as adults, like this is the wave of what's happening and whether you like it or not, this is going to be more prevalent in our universities and in our university in, 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 and so take the leap um, and, and I think the good news is that you get to do, it's really yours, it really has your fingerprints on it, it's your teaching and it can be very interactive and intimate. I think there's another reason this tip in 2011. Around 2011 was the first generation that had come through that had always had technology in their hands. They grew up with it. They always had smartphones. They went through high school with smartphones. They went through college with smartphones. So the ability to go into this chasm where technology was kind of avoided became less uh, desirable. And schools saw that. They saw that they needed to blend these things because kids were used to it. They had, I mean, walk around and, and, and everybody, whether you're on the, the shuttle or you're at a, at a concert or whatever, everybody has that technology and, and is linked to that in their hands. So I think that was part of it. I'd like to address your uh, question in terms of being a technophobe and your question in terms of it doesn't always work. Um, one of the things you have to do with new technologies is keep a sense of humor because that's reality with this stuff. <laughs> Even the best and the most reliable, sometimes there's going to be a glitch. Um, that's just the way it is. Be willing to explore. Be willing to try new things. You know, go out there on Merlot. Look at, at for free educational resources. Not just Khan Academy. There is a wealth of stuff out there that, that's available. And you know, a wealth of things you can create. Even more important, the generation that's coming up now, they already know how to create videos. They're on Instagram every day. They can create content like you wouldn't believe. And, and what we see in technology is, you know, Ken, Sir Ken Robinson says, technology is only technology if it happened before you were born. You know, and, and that's right. You know, once you're used to it, none of us thought of the telephone as technology, but it was technology to some people. Um, you know, once something happens and it tips, it, we get it in a wave. It happened with video. In video, we were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and now video is, at least at this university, uh, way too prevalent. <coughs> um, it, it's, it's here. We're seeing it now with augmented reality. You know, we waited and waited and waited and waited. Now for $12.99 a month, you can get uh, an uh, augmented uh, reality uh, app and download it and, and have uh, pictures in 3D and video. Um, take a picture of Ben Franklin and your app will tell you all about Ben. Um, so things come in waves. And once the technology is here, facial recognition is another one. Uh, facial re recognition, we waited and waited and waited. It's here. There are programs and apps now that take a picture of you. And if it's not you, you're not signing on to the, to the LMS or you're not able to get into that application. So once it comes, it's not going away. Technology never goes backwards. It doesn't go away. And, and it hits in waves. Uh, the current wave is the video wave. 
Um, my guess is the next wave will be uh, <coughs> augmented reality um, and wearables are coming in, the Internet of Things are coming in. Um, again, it's counterintuitive. We always think of learning in the classroom. And what this has done and is continuing to do is allow us to extend that um, way and with technologies way beyond just the classroom. So just spinning out of, I have a question for you, Pat. So you're in still in this blended mode. I mean, if you took the step, the leap into an all online course, which of your courses do you think would fit into that? I mean, can you see? I think you could do any of them. Really? But, you yeah. think you could do it? But, but. And what's standing in the way? Are, are you ready to do that, or is there something standing in the nobody's, way? Nobody's asked me to do that. Yeah. No, I mean, um, you know, one thing. They, if, they, they just assigned me to yeah. the classroom. I mean, one challenge I, you know, and one thing at AU, um, you know, it, it is still very new. I mean, we're in like our third year of really doing this and with the supports in place. And so um, there, as I've mentioned with instructional design, we want, we're, there are people like this. In my interview here, I remember a faculty member who was on my search committee said, I didn't know people like you like did that, you know, like I didn't know you existed. I didn't know there was a whole thing in it, you know, so. So there, there is support here at AU, but our resources are still fairly limited. Um, there is support, but <coughs> at an administrative level, we do think a lot about um, what courses are appropriate to go online. Um, we're at a phase now, um, you know, within both of the schools I work for, where we don't want to say, yes, if you want to put it online, go ahead, do it, because we want to make sure we have the resources in place to say, okay, you want to put the resources online? This is exactly who's going to support you in that. This is exactly when we're going to do it, and these are, this, this is what's going to be available to you. So we've kind of reached that point, I think, at AU um, with, with most schools. But we do have a lot of support in CTRL. They have a wonderful training course. Um, each school, I think, now almost has at least one part-time staff person who either has instructional design background or knows of what you're supposed to do in that school, whether it's with a partner or internally. So um, you're not doing it alone. Um, but, but there definitely is, and you do need to understand, while we want everybody to take that leap and move forward, you can take the CTRL class at any time. Um, but from an administrative standpoint, there is still a lot of strategy that goes behind what goes online, what's the most appropriate, when should we do it, and we want to make sure that we do it right. We want to make sure that we support you when we do it. Any other questions? Okay, so how do we start? How do you start? Talk to your administrator. Talk to your program director. Um, and, and say that you want to go online. Okay, so, okay. Start where you are. Start yeah. with the content that you have, yeah. with what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. Sit like down that. and talk to Stephanie or talk to Joy and say, you know, hey, here's the class I've been doing, here's the, the lectures I've been doing, or the PowerPoints I've been using, or the exercises and assignments I've been doing. How do we take this and convert it to an online class? And yeah. they, they'd be more than happy to, I drove to help this. you. You know, I knew that I, I was the driver, and you're the driver, and everybody <laughs> who's teaching a class um, could, could drive this. I mean, if you get the support from your dean, we're in the School of Professional Extended Studies, and this is our heartbeat. This is our future. And so, I mean, I can't wait to take one of my writing classes and not in the, you know, and, and teach it to an international audience. I think this is going it, to, it's made for this. Um, so you're the driver. What school are you in? Well, I'm, I was here at AU, but I'm not here anymore. But okay. I mm -hmm. teach over Trinity. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we're giving you secrets for another college. Hey, I, it's I, fine. Pat's full time. Yeah. <laughs> We're good. Uh, going to what you with Pat Jeff's said. comment that so don't do lectures because nobody watches for more than seven minutes. Your <laughs> comment that videos are grossly overdone. Your Bye. comment about asynchronous. What in the world, going to his question, are we supposed to be putting online? If I go to the dean and say I'd like to do a course and he says you do lectures, nobody watches lectures for more than seven minutes no. and we don't do videos, mm -hmm. what are we supposed to be putting out there? So what, I, what is the plan that we should be proposing? I would tell you, it's, it is unique. It is unique to your course. And the instructional designer um, can sit down. I can tell you, I can, again, I could look at a syllabus from basket weaving to <coughs> science and say, all right, um, this, is, this is your syllabus that you've been doing. This is great. This is, let's work together to break it down into weeks. And this, this is how much video. People don't watch videos more than seven minutes. That's right. There's actually research on that. Five to seven minutes. That's but they it. listen to you for an hour in class. They, they don't listen in class. That's the problem. I don't think, you I don't think that this is an online problem versus offline. Because you, two, years ago, two years ago, we had a, 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 a speaker um, at lunchtime here 
who acquainted me with the most astonishing figure because they wired students' brains for a week and discovered that the only activity that offered less brain activity than, le uh, than sleeping was lectures, sitting in a lecture. It's so passive. like, I'm like, don't do that. Passive. That's you know, it's you just, it's do. not, you know, so, so what, I'm, uh, what I've always tried to do is say, what, do, what are my learning objectives for them? Mm -hmm. Then how do I get them to buy into doing that rather than to say, how do I tell them that? Because they don't, they're not listening. So do you have them, um, it, and I mean, this is a, you know, so what do you put, like we, when we taped our lectures, um, and Stephanie, I did a. And they're not lectures, they're no, mini videos. Mini vid and I was like, minutes, and I wanted, know. and Stephanie kept saying, no, but you can't make these more than five minutes, because, you know, to, to write a book takes more than explaining for five minutes, but Stephanie kept saying, they will only listen, we've got to break your five minutes up into three two-minute things, and you're thinking, um, but, you know, how do you, so you're in a classroom, um, well, and you, you want to talk more than five, you have more than five minutes, do you have them share with each other? Because we do need to teach for an hour in a five minutes. So, you know, the way that... And and I, how I, am I feeling that time? Yeah, I mean, because what so they're I'm, most interested in doing is talking themselves or sharing yeah, right. or being in a conversation, and you can do that online. You know, I'm just going to tell you that what happens, and this was so fun, it was like being a kid. If somebody wants to talk, there's a little hand that goes up online, and, and, and you can say, yes, Peter, you can talk. And then in, and if Peter doesn't want to talk, he can press the mute button. And if Peter doesn't want to listen to me, he can go offline. But I see Peter leave the screen, and I say, Peter, where are you going? <laughs> um, but, you know, so the, and the students can talk to each other in a chat, chat, I call it a chat room, which it shouldn't be called, um, you know, on the side. And so they like that more than anything. <laughs> so what would you do? To so I have to say, I mean, I am the poster child for the Ann Farron Conference because, <laughs> right. because I didn't know anything about teaching when I came here. And I went here. I was actually sent here because I was such a terrible teacher. Um, and have picked up tips every single year. Uh, but one of the things I, I found was like, there's all these really great books that will also help you. Like Nikichi's Teaching Tips is actually a really great book. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assigning one to several of the students in, in my class here. Um, uh, what is her first name? Davis Gross. Oh. Tools for teaching. Yeah, it's the Tools for Teaching book. So, but what I learned is that interactivity is the is the key, mm -hmm. and uh, that there's many many techniques and, and tools, but, but they're but they're all going to roll out based on what you actually want them to to do. So my the week. The, the week's work for me is highly structured to set them up so that they can do interactivity, interactive activities once they get into the classroom. So whether it's scenarios or, or a debate or um, breaking them down into groups of two to discuss, or um, I don't necessarily do this with the graduate students, but with the undergraduates, I actually give them questions that they have to be able to answer and then they have to, whether it's graduate students or undergraduates, they all have to report on the work that they did in the week in some kind of uh, output that I have to grade every week. <coughs> um, but it, it guarantees that they did it. Um, and they did it in a structured way that it makes them think about five, these five questions about the material. And then when they come into class, those five questions are going to get addressed in some way, in small groups, by trading assignments, in grading each other's assignments, or scenarios or put on a play or you know. and see this is great stuff and it is challenging to create but, the same kind of power online but it can't be done oh I think it can be done very easily yeah it, sometimes it's easier like right. one time we had snow and I have a Facebook page associated but private Facebook page associated with my classes too and um, they like Facebook a lot better than they like anything on blackboard to just do more informal back and forth but I was scared to put, go to collaborate because we had so many electrical issues with this, with this, um, um, uh, the storm, and I wasn't sure how many people were even going to be able to get online. So I had a very low bar. I was like, I'm going to post some questions on Facebook that we are going to dialogue on, and we'll just do that, and we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes, and go <laughs> there sometime in the two and a half hour block that we usually work. We yeah. usually work. To the best of your ability, and if you you know you can't do that, you can't do that. But 
it was the most amazing, lively discussion. And what was really interesting is it was a class of graduate students and undergraduates, and usually the graduate students dominate. The gr undergraduates kind of Brilliant. flourished <laughs> in this discussion, and they were leaping in, and there were it, it would happen in the middle of the course. So the course actually changed its tone. Hmm in the second half because people had participated who, who weren't used to being heard. So we have time for a couple more uh, questions. Yes, we I have, have five more minutes. I don't know if anybody could um, answer. So I'm a doctoral student in uh, SOC and a first year student. I've never taught before, so I'm thinking of sort of like resume development and how to make myself marketable mm -hmm. you know, when I, when I leave here. And do you think developing an online skill set and even um, thousand percent to say I've got this course, I've got this in the can, is that something people are doing? Is that yes. we would, are some schools gonna look at it and go, oh she teaches online. You should actually have a she course in that. Person, like. No, I think online is extremely in demand. Um, and I think that, that that curve in demand is going like this. I mean it's it's a steep curve that's rising very quickly. Um, I think it makes you more marketable both mm -hmm. in the higher education world but also if you decide to go into the corporate world. The corporate world is considerably ahead of where higher education is in terms of adopting this. And really, it's, it's strict economics. You talk about some of these large corporations, large pharmaceuticals, large financial companies. They've got international workforces with hundreds of thousands of people to train and to teach. <coughs> so they had financial incentives to put these things into place um, with, with more expediency than perhaps higher ed. I would definitely, definitely do that. I, I, I think it makes you more desirable across the board. I don't think face-to-face -face is going away. I don't think face-to-face -face is unimportant. But I do think we're entering an era where it will all be blended. It will all be blended. Mm -hmm. There will be a few schools like Bard that hang out there and say, you know what, we're Bard, we're not going to look at SATs, we're not going to use technology, we're not putting anything online, we're going to do what we've always done. And God bless them, they're good at what they, they do, they've got the endowment, go for it. But, but that's rare. But you know, the students are, are so there. I, I teach a film class. Yep. and. Um, so some, most of these films are available one Absolutely. way or another, but, but several are not, and except, if, except I had one student who was like, <laughs> I have been able to BitTorrent and download everything and I have them all on a thumb drive for anyone who right. wants one. Right. And I'm like, go oh, you, I didn't hear that, but here she is. <laughs> and I think that's, that's, that's part of the yeah. mind shift. Yeah. You know, the mind shift is in this world, it's an open source, open kind of social kind of environment, which is, a hundred. again, it's 180 degrees from the, I'm the expert, I'm going to tell you, you're going to listen to me, to learner setter, this is all about you, I'm a guide, I, I'm, I'm not the, 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 the maker of your right. learning, I can't learn you, and telling you isn't, isn't learning you, we know that, we know that from research, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's, it's a, and to circle, um, I was just going to say, and just to very directly answer your question, yeah. if you're interested in teaching, mm -hmm. I can tell you at AU, in the, the public communication division, we actually changed our term description to include a preferred oh. yeah. element of, of okay. having online yeah, experience. experience. So sure. um, we actually are making that shift here and anywhere that's off going online, which is yeah. most places, is doing that too. So I want to circle back. Joy? Oh, I just want to add one thing onto that is, um, you know, one of the ugly truths you'll discover is you continue in your doctoral education is there aren't <laughs> enough faculty jobs out there for all the PhDs. Right. That's right. the reality. And so I think by diversifying your skill set and being yeah. someone who's marketable in other sectors, like Bobby's saying, like in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, you know, you may end up doing adjunct work and the jobs may not be in the place or the time that allow you to teach face to face. And so I think by diversifying your skill set and picking up some of those things, you're not just going to be more marketable for traditional faculty appointments, but you're going to expand your career path. And I'm telling you this as someone who was a tenured faculty member and is now an instructional designer. Yeah. I just found I liked that work better, and it was a better use of my skills, and I just kind of gravitated to that. And it was experimenting with the technology and teaching online that got me in that career path. I just cannot imagine that higher ed is going to look 
like it does now, 10 years from now. Right. I just cannot imagine that. No. And, so, and for the same reason that, you know, these fine ladies have been saying, it just, you know, um, these, are, these are not even advanced skills, they're basic skills. And just to wrap, to, to, to end where we started, as, as a adult, you know, when you think about um, those of you who are parents or aunts or uncles, you know, there's such joy when kids learn how to do new things. And, you know, and as you age or <coughs> grow up, uh, I don't like the word age, being, um, you know, to learn new things at every stage of your life is really invigorating. I never expected to be so excited by this. But, um, to master new skills. I mean, every week when Stephanie and I would talk on the phone, I would know something new. And it was really exciting to learn new things. And, uh, and also to be very vulnerable and self-deprecating, I kept saying to these students, this is my first time. <laughs> Professor Krasno, we can't hear you. You sound like you're underwater with a scuba <laughs> dive in. And I'd say, I know. All right, so I, let me hold off. I've got to get Stephanie on the phone. I call <laughs> Stephanie on my cell phone. In the, it was very unprofessional. She goes, OK, I'm coming into the virtual classroom. Hi, everybody. I'm fixing it. So I mean, you can also, it's, it, everyone has the first time. But I encourage you to contact any of these experts in the subject, or you can talk to me and you know, go for it. And Happy New Year. Um, just to, you know, in January we're doing something uh, for the AU, A Healthy U, we're doing a seminar called um, uh, A New Year, A New You, The Empowered Next Step. It's a brown bagger, <coughs> and maybe your empowered next step is to take on online teaching. So thank you for coming.